Hey everyone, welcome back to Thread Education. Sorry for the delay while I've been working on a number of new exciting projects that I'll be announcing very soon, but for today, I'm back with a video that I've been wanting to make for quite a while now. And yes, I am of course talking about the history of Comme des Garçons. I feel like this is a brand that just about everyone has heard of, but not everyone knows its story. So we'll be doing a deep dive into how it became the powerhouse that it is today, and of course we'll also be talking about the woman behind it all, Rei Kawakubo. I'm very excited for this, so without further ado, let's get right into it. This is the history of Comme des Garçons. In 1942, Rei Kawakubo was born in Tokyo, Japan. This was right during the middle of World War II, so I have to imagine that this made for a rather tumultuous childhood, and to make matters worse, her parents got divorced while she was still very young. Nowadays, married couples are getting divorced far more frequently, but in 1940s Japan, it was extremely uncommon, and the reason that they got divorced is because Rei's mother wanted to become a school teacher. The expectation was that women would just stay home and take care of their children, but when she refused to settle for that, it created a rift in her marriage, and her and her husband ended up separating. Ray later suggested that this made her feel like an outcast of sorts, because her family was not like any of the other families that she knew. But in hindsight, her mother's pursuit of independence gave her the courage to pursue her own independence. For that reason, Ray never sought to fit in with any of the other kids, and one of the ways that she differentiated herself was the way that she dressed. Despite having to wear a uniform to school, she started styling it in as many different ways as she could, and outside of school, she would really only wear the clothes that her mother custom made for her. The bottom line was that she had become deeply fascinated with her own aesthetic, and this set her down a path of a career in the arts. When she was old enough, she began studying fine arts at Tokyo's Kyo University, which happens to be where her father worked. At this point in time, I don't believe she had any intention of working in the fashion industry, but there's no doubt in my mind that her time spent studying different art styles would play a role in shaping her work as a designer. As we'll come to see, Rei finds herself somewhere in between the old guard and the new guard of the fashion industry. She's full of new ideas and loves to break rules, but at the same time, she has a deep appreciation for the art form and the history that precedes it. Now after graduating, Rei moved to Tokyo's Harajuku district, and if you've watched my video on the history of BAPE, you'll know that this was the place to be for young people who were into fashion. I guess you could sort of say that this was Tokyo's version of Soho, because people would just come to shop at the boutiques, hang out, and make connections with like-minded individuals. For someone like Rei who had felt like an outcast her entire childhood, this was the perfect environment, because she could finally dress the way that she wanted to without feeling out of place. It wasn't all fun and games, however, because now that she had graduated, she was in need of a job, and so she began working in the advertising department for a textile manufacturer. That may not sound too glamorous, but she just needed a way to support herself, and while she may not have known it at the time, taking this job would actually be her first step towards becoming a designer. You see, part of her job was staging photo shoots to display the company's textiles, and the best way to do that was to turn them into clothing. With her boss's permission, Ray would take whatever fabric they were trying to promote, figure out a way to turn it into clothing, and they would have a model wear the clothing in their advertisements. She wasn't necessarily trying to impress anybody with her designs, she just wanted it to look good in the photos. But the outcome was so stunning that one day, a co-worker pulled her aside and encouraged her to leave the textile manufacturer and instead pursue fashion. Ray agreed to give it a try, but her plan wasn't to go and start a brand of her own. Rather, she decided to branch off as a stylist. All things considered, she enjoyed her new job, but there was one problem. The looks that she wanted to create for many of her clients simply didn't exist, and so much like she had done at her last job, she took matters into her own hands and started making the pieces herself. It got to the point where people started coming to her just for the pieces she was making, and after nearly two years of this, she decided that if she wanted to keep up with the demand, she needed to make a change. And with that settled, she officially began preparing to launch her own label. In 1969, Rei Kawakubo officially launched a women's wear label called Comme des Garçons. Now if you can't already tell, Comme des Garçons is a French name, and at first it seems like a rather strange choice for a Japanese label. That of course leads us to the question, where did the name come from? 
Well, as it turns out, it actually comes from a song called Tous les garçons et les filles by the French singer Francois Hardy. The title of the song translates to All the Boys and Girls, and one of the lyrics in the song is Comme les garçons et les filles de mon âge, which translates to Like Boys and Girls My Age. The song is basically about a girl watching everyone around her fall in love, all the while wondering when she'll finally find a love interest of her own. I'm not exactly sure how Ray found this song, but it clearly resonated with her, and it is the confirmed origin of the brand's name. So in summary, Comme des Garçons is just French for like boys, or like some boys, depending on how you translate it. So having settled on the name, Ray got to work, and before long several of her pieces were being sold in boutiques throughout Tokyo. She was still somewhat new to this, but people really gravitated towards her aesthetic. It was dark, seeing as she was almost always using the color black, it experimented with a range of cuts and proportions, and it walked a fine line between the principles of Japanese and French fashion. In other words, Comme de Garçon offered customers a daring yet refreshing look that they couldn't really find anywhere else, and that is why it was so quick to gain traction. Building off of this initial success, Ray opened Tokyo's first Comme de Garçon boutique in 1975, and this really helped solidify the brand's identity. It had been selling well in other boutiques, but having a central location where people could come and buy Comme de Garçon products is what really helped the brand's cult following start to form. In 1978, Ray then introduced a menswear line called Homme Comme de Garçon, with Homme simply being the French word for man. While starting a menswear line may have seemed like the obvious next step, I don't want to understate its importance because it truly did expose the brand to a whole new customer base. As expected, this only fueled Comme de Garçon's popularity further, and by the early 1980s, the name Ray Kawakubo was frequently brought up in discussions about the best up-and-coming designers in the industry. Rather than rest on her laurels, however, Ray knew that she needed to make a change if she wanted to remain relevant. You see, people everywhere were beginning to learn about Comme des Garçons, but the brand hadn't really made any moves towards international expansion. Just to put this into perspective, Comme des Garçons had made its way onto the shelves of more than 100 different stores by 1980, but every single one of them was in Japan. And because this was a period in time where online shopping and social media did not exist, becoming a truly global brand proved to be a much more difficult task. That said, Ray needed to find a way for the rest of the world to see her designs, and she had just the right idea. In 1981, Comme des Garçons presented its first ever runway show at Paris Fashion Week. In the fashion world, Paris Fashion Week is the main stage so to speak, meaning that it promised the type of exposure that Ray was looking for. But it also put a lot of pressure on her to deliver a collection that people would remember. It's safe to say she did just that, because the collection sent the fashion media into a frenzy. Some criticized the collection for being too avant-garde, but others praised it as innovative and cutting edge. One of the major criticisms was that it relied too heavily on the color black, but this did not deter Ray, and if anything, she actually embraced it. Due to their proclivity towards the color black, the media began referring to Ray and her followers as the Crows, and over time, this name is something that Comme des Garçons fans have actually come to carry with pride. In fact, this show is often cited as the beginning of the Karasuzoku movement. Karasuzoku is Japanese for Crow Tribe, and it describes a trend in Japan where people would wear all black designer clothing head to toe. Another important figure in this movement was the legendary designer Yoji Yamamoto, and it's worth mentioning that Yoji and Rei actually started dating around this time. It's kind of funny to think that the name Comme des Garçons was inspired by a song about a girl waiting to find love, and thanks to networking opportunities provided by her label's success, she was able to find love of her own. Although they would not end up together in the long run, the creative partnership that Rei and Yoji formed played a major role in furthering both of their careers, and today, they're looked at as two of the key figures in the popularization of Japanese fashion. Now going back to the collection, people may have had mixed feelings about it, but there is no denying that it caused quite a stir. And as they say, there's no such thing as bad publicity. As a matter of fact, Rei decided to leverage this publicity by opening a store in Paris that same year. This opened the door for Comme des Garçons to become more popular in the French fashion market, and by extension, this opened the door for Comme des Garçons to become more popular in the global fashion market. This is the exact outcome that Ray had been hoping for, and in hindsight, her decision to enter the fashion week circuit changed the trajectory of the brand forever. In 1982, Ray decided to step things up a notch with the presentation of her Destroy collection, and this is now considered to be one of her career's defining collections. The pieces were dark, tattered, and looked more like hand-me-downs than luxury garments, but that was exactly the point. 
You see, Ray is widely considered to be a pioneer of something called anti-fashion. For context, anti-fashion is the term used to describe fashion that intentionally contradicts the norm, usually with the intention of purveying some deeper message. While she would do this many times and in many different ways throughout her career, the Destroy Collection is a particularly good example because it highlights the different risks and rewards that anti-fashion can have. To put it simply, some people will appreciate that you're trying to do something different, and others will not. In this case, the so-called Crow Tribe loved the collection, but the same could not be said for many members of the mainstream media. You see, one of the greatest challenges that Rei faced early on in her career is that people tried to place her in this box of being a Japanese designer whose only point of reference was Japanese fashion. Don't get me wrong, Rei is one of the most prolific figures in the history of Japanese fashion, but what I'm saying is that these media outlets treated that as her entire identity, as exemplified by critics who used phrases like Hiroshima chic and post-atomic to describe her work. I think it goes without saying that comments like these are reductive and even downright offensive, but she never let this dissuade her. And with each new collection, more and more of those who had once criticized Rey found themselves at her shows standing among the crows. With Comme des Garçons' international expansion officially underway, Ray was in need of some help, and so in 1984, she hired a 23-year-old pattern maker who had just graduated from Japan's legendary Bunka Fashion College. She had no idea at the time, but this would prove to be a major turning point in the brand's history, because this young pattern maker was none other than Junya Watanabe. At some point I'll think I'll need to make an entire video on Junya Watanabe, but all you need to know for now is that at this point in the story, he was fresh out of school looking to make his mark on the fashion industry, and as one of the hottest brands out at the time, Comme des Garçons promised him the opportunity to do just that. Now Ray hired Junya because she was impressed with his portfolio of work, but I don't think that even she could have predicted how quickly he'd become a key part of the brand's success. Something we haven't talked about much up until this point is that Ray is an incredibly solitary person. She's often silent in social settings, she rarely gives interviews, and according to some reports, she even refrained from letting her former partner Yoji Yamamoto become too involved in her work. The point I'm getting at here is that Ray is incredibly protective of her creative process, but for some reason, Junya Watanabe was the exception. Rather than treating him as just another employee, Ray began to mentor Junya and before long, she was trusting him with a surprising amount of responsibility. So much so, in fact, that in 1987, just three years after he had joined, she appointed him to be the head of Comme des Garçons' recently formed knitwear line called Trico. This gave Junya a level of creative control that he'd never had before, and he did not disappoint. But fast forward a few years, and like many young designers working for big name brands, he began to explore the possibility of launching his own label. Fortunately for him, Ray was incredibly supportive of the idea, and offered to help him do it under the umbrella of Comme des Garçons. This was sort of a win-win situation, because not only did it allow him to remain at Comme des Garçons where he would continue helping her, but it also gave him access to resources that he otherwise wouldn't have had. With that settled, Junya got to work, and in 1992 he officially launched Junya Watanabe Comme des Garçons. Like I said, I'm gonna go into more depth about Junya in another video because there are a handful of collections and collaborations that I want to talk about, but for now just know that Comme des Garçons is successful in its own right, but it's also acted as a launching pad for several other careers. Speaking of which, Junya was not the only important figure to join the brand during this time frame, and this time, I'm not talking about a designer. Instead, I'm talking about the business magnet Adrian Joff, and to explain this next part of the story, we're gonna have to backtrack a little bit. In 1953, Adrian Joff was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, but his family relocated to London when he was just 8 years old. All things considered, he had a relatively normal upbringing, and when he was old enough, he enrolled in the University of London's School of Oriental and African Studies where he majored in Oriental Studies. The program offered an education in Eastern cultures, histories, and languages, but it turns out that Adrian was the only student to enroll in the program, and so the school decided to shut it down entirely. With no real backup plan in place, he found himself feeling a bit lost, but then he had an idea. If the school wasn't going to give him the education he wanted, he figured the next best option would be to go out and get it himself. So on a whim, he packed his bags, and without really knowing what he'd do once he got there, he boarded a one-way flight to Japan. 
In an interview with the Financial Times, Adrian recalls feeling right at home as soon as he arrived in Japan, and as if the universe was telling him he'd made the right decision, opportunities just started falling into his lap. You see, being in Japan was great, but Adrian still needed a way to make money. And by chance, his sister Rose had recently started a knitwear company and needed help finding a distributor in Japan. As her only real connection in Japan, Adrian agreed to help her out, and somehow, some way, he successfully negotiated a deal on her behalf. He had no formal experience in either fashion or business, but this venture served as an introduction to both, and from that point forward, he began looking at this as a viable career path. Now that it was essentially his job, Adrian found himself becoming deeply immersed in the world of Japanese fashion, and in the same interview with the Financial Times that I referenced earlier, he says that the one brand he really gravitated towards was Comme des Garçons. To say that he gravitated towards the brand might even be putting it lightly, because on more than one occasion he found himself spending entire paychecks on new pieces. Given his love for the brand, he was well aware of its founder, Rei, and he actually saw her walking the streets of Tokyo a few times, but never had the courage to introduce himself. Nevertheless, his chance would soon come, because in 1987, Adrian got a call from a friend saying that Comme des Garçons was looking for a commercial director in Europe. This was the exact line of work that he was interested in, and given his background, he seemed like the perfect fit. So the friend arranged a meeting between Adrian and Rei, and the rest is history. Adrian quickly became the driving force behind Comme des Garçons business operations, and this gave Ray the freedom she needed to focus all of her attention on designing collections. Beyond their working relationship, Ray and Adrian also formed a deeply personal relationship, and in 1992, they actually got married. The following year, he was promoted to the role of president, and the two of them have remained both romantic partners and business partners ever since. Together they felt like they could take over the fashion industry, and heading into the early 2000s, that's exactly what they planned to do. This next part of the story begins with Philip Pagowski, a Polish artist who fell in love with Comme des Garçons sometime during the 1980s. In a later interview, Philip revealed that he was initially introduced to Comme des Garçons because his wife at the time was modeling for the brand. She introduced him to some of her connections, and in an unexpected twist, they actually invited him to model for their 1992 menswear show in Paris. By this point, he'd already started sending Ray some of his work, hoping that he'd be interested in a collaboration, and as it turns out, she was. By the late 1990s, Philip had started working with Comme des Garçons in the capacity of a collaborator slash consultant, and he would regularly submit ideas for different projects that Ray was working on. One day, while working on something entirely unrelated, an image suddenly popped into Philip's head, and he quickly jotted it down before it could escape him. What was that image, you may ask? Well, it was a heart with two eyes. As soon as he'd drawn it, Philip knew that he had to send it to Ray, and that's honestly one of the most fascinating things about this story. At this point, Comme des Garçons had no history of using bold graphics or bright colors. In fact, it was quite the opposite, as most collections were minimally branded and relied almost exclusively on the color black. So that leads us to the question, what was it about this heart that made Philip think it was right for Comme des Garçons? Well, I guess you could chalk some of this up to fate and say that he just had a gut feeling it would work, but if you ask me, the heart logo kind of reminds me of Ray. It has eyes but no mouth, and that's somewhat reminiscent of the fact that she's a silent, yet observant and imposing figure. At the same time, she doesn't conform to anyone's standards or expectations, and I think that's reflected in the fact that the heart is more of a sketch than it is a perfect outline. Now the other interesting thing is that when Philip first submitted this design to Ray, she wasn't quite sure what to do with it, and as a matter of fact, she did nothing with it. Yes, it was a great logo, but it simply didn't fit into any of the collections she was working on. At least that was the case until the early 2000s, which is when she began preparing to launch a new line called Comme des Garçons Play. From its outset, Comme des Garçons Play was meant to be unlike anything that Ray had ever done before. It was supposed to be fun, it was supposed to be colorful, and as the name Play implies, it was supposed to be worn casually. From a business standpoint, I believe that this was also supposed to have greater commercial appeal, and to accomplish that, Ray needed to create brand recognition. Yes, people already knew the name Comme des Garçons, but if she was going to make simpler pieces like t-shirts and hoodies, there needed to be something that let people know it was made by Comme des Garçons. And with that in mind, Ray looked no further than the heart logo that Philip had sent her. 
Play officially launched in 2002, and it was an instant hit. Building off of the brand's reputation, and thanks to the help of early adopters like Drake and Kanye, it wasn't long before this little heart logo was being seen just about everywhere. And over the next decade or so, it would effectively transcend the fashion industry. What I mean by this is that people who have zero interest in fashion now recognize and even wear this heart logo, just because of how big this trend has become. As I'm sure many of you are aware, a major part of this has been Play's partnership with Converse. In continuation of its mission to deliver high quality, affordable products that people can play in, Comme des Garçons Play lended its heart logo to the Converse Chuck Taylors back in 2009, marking the beginning of what would become one of the most successful footwear collaborations of all time. Over the past decade, they've released a number of different models featuring the heart logo, and while I do think that these have already peaked in popularity, I still see people wearing them just about everywhere I go. Now to me, the craziest thing about all of this is that nowadays when people hear the name Comme des Garçons, many people think of Comme des Garçons play instead of the mainline. I don't think that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but one of the reasons that I wanted to make this video is to remind everyone that this is a brand with a rich history of collections curated by one of the most influential designers of all time. While it would be great if Ray got all of the credit that she deserves for kicking off the global phenomenon that is Comme des Garçons play, part of me also finds it kind of fitting. As we've discussed, she's a very quiet person who rarely, if ever, seeks out the spotlight, so I'm sure she's quite pleased that play has taken on a life of its own. And on that note, I think it's important that we discuss another one of Ray's creations that has taken on a life of its own, Dover Street Market. Sometime during the early 2000s, Comme des Garçons started hosting a number of pop-up shops around the world. They did, of course, already have brick and mortar locations, but Ray and Adrian really fell in love with the idea of curating an experience that transcended traditional retail shopping. In fact, they loved it so much that they decided to make it a bit more permanent. The two of them began discussing the possibility of opening a store that more or less coexisted as an art installation. And while I know that sounds like a really cool idea to begin with, I also want to point out how smart it is. For as long as retail shopping has existed, sellers have been aware of the fact that presentation matters. I mean, that's why these luxury brands spend so much money on making their stores look luxurious. It really does affect the way that buyers perceive the actual clothing. Taking that into consideration, Ray and Adrian decided that if their store doubled as an art museum, buyers would perceive the clothing for what it truly is, art. To that end, they planned on opening a location where all of the Comme des Garçons brands, as well as other luxury and streetwear brands, would be displayed alongside art installations. When they were finally ready to turn this concept into a reality, the only task left was finding the right place to do it, and as luck would have it, they had to look no further than a six-story building located on Dover Street in London. As I'm sure you've already pieced together, the store is of course named after this location, and it's sort of funny to think that if this building hadn't been available, or if they had decided on one somewhere else, there would be no Dover Street Market. But anyways, more about the building itself, one of the interesting things is that it was not in any of London's traditional shopping districts. Instead, it was situated among a slew of different art galleries, and it actually used to be home to London's Institute of Contemporary Arts. Given the theme that they were going for, this couldn't have been more fitting, but the decision really came down to the fact that this location offered them the most space. You see, one of Ray and Adrian's main sources of inspiration was Kensington Market. In case you aren't familiar, Kensington Market is a neighborhood in downtown Toronto that is known for being home to a mix of different cultures, and this of course includes different types of art, music, food, and fashion. In the spirit of Kensington Market, they thought it would be cool if each of the six floors had an entirely different style and aesthetic, meaning that each one would offer the customer a unique shopping experience. Much like people wander aimlessly through Kensington Market, Ray and Adrian wanted customers to wander from floor to floor of the store, not quite knowing what to expect next, but all the while enjoying every step of the way. So between being located on Dover Street and being inspired by Kensington Market, I'm sure you can see where the full name Dover Street Market comes from. They officially opened their doors on September of 2004, and in many ways, retail shopping hasn't been the same since. Whether they've done so knowingly or unknowingly, many fashion boutiques over the years have taken from Dover Street Market's approach to creating an immersive, memorable shopping experience. But rest assured, none of them have quite been able to match the original. 
A large part of that has been something that Ray and Adrian call Tachiagari. Tachiagari translates to beginning in Japanese, and it's the term they use to describe their biannual process of shutting down the store for a few days and bringing in new installations and collections. This is an incredibly important part of the store's success because it gives customers a reason to continue visiting the store time and time again. Not only that, but if you want to visit new stores time and time again, you can do that too. Because nowadays there are Dover Street Market locations in New York, Tokyo, Singapore, Beijing, Los Angeles, and Paris. There is of course still one in London, but I should note that it's no longer on Dover Street as it's moved into a larger building on Hay Market that actually used to be a Burberry store. Nevertheless, the name Dover Street Market lives on, and thanks to the brilliant creative minds of Ray and Adrian, I think it's safe to say that it will continue to for a very long time to come. That just about covers everything I wanted to touch on for the history of Comme des Garçons, and by now, hopefully you can see why I think that this is such an important story. From the very beginning, Rei Kawakubo knew that she wasn't quite like everybody else, and the thing that separated her from everybody else is that she took the initiative to put herself out there. After realizing her talent, she took a leap of faith and launched her own label, starting with just a handful of clients and quickly expanding to a cult following that sparked an entirely new movement in the fashion industry. Beyond that though, one of the most impressive things about Rei is how dynamic her style is. She made a name for herself with dark, gaunt clothing, but completely flipped the script by introducing a brighter, more playful line called Comme des Garçons Play. As we've discussed, Play took on a life of its own, and so did Dover Street Market. It says a lot that everything Ray works on becomes wildly successful, but many people don't even know that she's the one behind it. Part of this can be attributed to the fact that she's naturally quiet, but it can also be attributed to the fact that she lets art speak for itself. There are times where I wish other designers would follow her lead in this respect, but I think the important thing to remember here is that Ray is truly one of a kind. We have to appreciate that there aren't many designers like her. Even as a child, she always viewed herself as the odd one out, but she never looked at that as a bad thing. Nowadays, people become so obsessed with fitting in, or on the contrary, they become so obsessed with being different that they just try to be different in the same way that other people are being different. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but what I'm trying to say is that remaining true to who you are as an artist is the only way to make a difference. Rei Kawakubo had the courage to do just that, and in doing so, she reshaped fashion in ways that few people ever could have imagined. Anyways, that is all for this video. If you liked it and want to see more like it, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and other than that, I will see you next time.